Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bassam Haddad. I am going to be co-hosting this event along with my uh, partner and co-host uh, in crime, uh, Mariam Durani. And we are very uh, delighted uh, to be hosting Hiro Funes and Maura Finkelstein for this first episode or first session of In Defense of Academic Freedom, Defamation, Intimidation, and Suspension. We are billing this as a series, so there will be more to come. Uh, this is uh, the first installment, and we hope to uh, come back with a number of others pretty soon. This event is uh, organized by the DC, Maryland, and Virginia Faculty for Academic Freedom, the MESA Task Force on Civil and Human Rights is co-sponsoring, as well as the Gaza and Context Collaborative Project and the uh, Faculty for Justice in Palestine Network, which includes more than 115 chapters nationwide. Uh, and we are uh, starting with this particular uh, event, uh, largely because of the uh, important cases uh, that Jairo and Maura uh, represent. And in this installment, our guests have been uh, actually invited because they were either suspended or placed on administrative leave for their support for Palestine and Israel's ongoing genocide in Gaza. They will tell their own story and address the context of their scholarship and their advocacy as well as how their academic freedom was violated. And uh, joining me here to share more about uh, how they are not alone is Maryam. And before I introduce Maryam, let me ask you, Maryam, how are you? One second. Here? Yes. You're good. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm really glad to be here, Bassam, with you. But um, you know, it's also every morning we wake up and we and we learn more about the genocide, and it is. Um, it's something that you know stays with you all day as you're doing everything else, and so I'm I'm really glad to be here, and I'm really glad to be um, in support of both Hiro and Mora as as they're dealing with this, and also to send a message to other faculty um, and scholars that um, we're in this together. Uh, thanks, Mariam. Let me just say a couple words about you. Uh, you, uh, you. <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, Mariam is a professor is a professional lecturer at the School of International service and uh, a faculty affiliate with the Anti-Racism Research and Policy Center at American University. As a decolonial feminist anthropologist, Dr. Dorani's scholarship seeks to shift how academia, media, and public discourse reflect on and reckon with the racialized Muslim subject, in quotation mark, and the impact of global wars on higher education in the US and Pakistan. I will let uh, Maryam take it from here. And before uh, you take it over. Let me just say uh, hello, uh, Hiro and Mora. How are you guys? It's wonderful to be here and I'll echo Mariam's sentiments. Um, I think this is really important. And also we're in month six of genocide and it's, it's exhausting and devastating. I'm doing well. Thank you, Basam and Mariam, for uh, inviting me. It's uh, just a pleasure to finally see you uh, in person, and I'm looking forward to the conversation with Maura. Ahlan wa sahlan. Thank you all so much. Um, so yes, as we're getting started, I think we just wanted to kind of, you know, introduce how, how this conversation began with um, the DMV Faculty for Academic Freedom, which is a group of us here in the DMV faculty from across the universities uh, that have organized in recent months um, in order to sh start to share information with each other about what we're dealing with, what are the policies that are playing out on our campuses, and how do we kind of work together. And so on that note, I just wanted to share that, you know, um, there's many cases of faculty who have been uh, dealing with this uh, targeted repression. Um, and so a few of the cases, you know, that come to mind are uh, Professor Russell Rickford at Cornell um, in October. Uh, there was an adjunct faculty at Stanford in October that was also suspended. And the language that was used um, <clears throat> 
to uh, address the issue was to talk about how academic freedom does not permit the identity-based targeting of students. Um, later, we had in January, mm -hmm. Professor Abdul Qadir Sino, who was uh, uh, put on suspension. And uh, this it was similar to, I think, uh, Hiro's case where the procedure was bypassed. Um, and so there are these cases, again, of how the university is responding to these issues and kind of not following their own policy or, or producing new policies that then are affecting students and faculty. And so I think I just wanted to kind of situate this, this conversation um, in, this, in this context um, of the specific forms that faculty and students have been facing following uh, October 7th. And so with that, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Funes. Uh, Jairo Funes is an assistant professor of curriculum studies at Texas Tech University. Broadly speaking, his research is situated at the intersection of decolonial theory, critical ethnography, and social movement research. His work is particularly focused on examining how social movements unsettle coloniality in Latin America and the Caribbean. Dr. Funes's work situates decolonial thought within sites of struggle to make more visible the deeply entangled material and epistemic dimensions of decolonization and liberation movements. He has published articles in theory, culture, and society, globalization societies and education, and educational studies. He is also the co-editor of the Bristol University Press book series, Decolonization and Social Worlds, and lead editor of the Sage Handbook of Decolonial Theory. He is the program chair of the Decolonial, Postcolonial, and Anticolonial Studies in Education group for the American Educational Research Association. And so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us and telling us about what you've been dealing with. Welcome. Thank you, Mariam. So if you'd like to start by telling us a little bit about kind of the, the, uh, the, the uh, you know, how, how this story has played out, how you've been kind of uh, managing and dealing with it, and, um, and then we can go from there. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the introduction, uh, Mariam. Um, just to give you a brief uh, overview, um, my critiques of, of Israel, uh, my critiques of, of colonialism go back uh, several years, uh, I've been active, however, on um, on, on Twitter um, for maybe two or three years. So my critiques go back before October 7th. Since October 7th, I've received uh, numerous hate emails, uh, voicemails even, um, and I even received a letter in my office uh, in October. Uh, that sounded, uh, of course, like a, a death threat that my days were, were, were numbered and so on and so forth. So just many things that the university and the dean uh, in in my college was aware. Uh, I'm sure other administration were aware of that of that fact. Um, and since then, in October, there were numerous uh, screenshots shared with administration. I had uh, calls with the dean. The dean would uh, you know text me if I if I could have a conversation with him related to what was happening and the things that were circulating in the university, given that individuals, random individuals were CCing uh, the provost, president, and as well as alumni, the alumni association. The university didn't, however, uh, pay attention to, um, to these things because it was just random individuals. So there's a big, there's a, a clear uh, comparison that could be made with what happened in October and November with what happened later on if we move forward to February when a hit piece was written about me by a conservative uh, a far right media outlet, Texas Scorecard. And Texas Scorecard, if, if as I shared with in other interviews, is, a, um, is this uh, in now independent media outlet that was founded by a lobby group uh, here in Texas, uh, uh, Empower Texans. And Empower Texans is a powerful lobby group that has donated uh, millions of dollars to uh, Republican, uh, to the Republican Party, especially the far right uh, wings of the Republican Party here. And the same uh, politicians that have been placed um, and, and received donations from this uh, lobby group are the ones that have restructured education uh, in Texas, as we've seen in other states as well. Uh, two, three years uh, back, we saw the systematic restructuring of K-12 education. And then last year, we also saw 
the the changes that were made in um, whether it was getting rid of DEI and then also stripping away the uh, tenure protections under SB 18 bill that that was signed into law. And this uh, lobby group here was, uh, and we must know so we can make some connections with what's happening elsewhere uh, with Bill Ackman and, and, and others, other billionaires, Tim Dunn was the one that founded or is, is a founding figure of Empower Texans. And I make this and I, and I want to just provide this information because, as I mentioned before, there's a clear difference be, by, by the way that administration handled the situation in October with now the external pressure that they are receiving from this media outlet, but also the 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 powers that that have shaped this media outlet and what this media outlet actually does. On February 22nd, Texas Scorecard published this uh, hit piece on me, where they accuse me uh, of anti-Semitism, and they also provide it. It's called inv investigative reporting, which it wasn't really an investigative report. They just included screenshots of my my posts, um, and then. You know, or, or try to substantiate their claims that I'm anti-Semitic because of my critiques of Israel. I used profanity during the, the Super Bowl when there was massacre after massacre in Rafah in southern Gaza. And yes, I used profanity to refer to a nation state, a settler colonial a nation state at that. And so they they provided provided these screenshots. I the next day on February 23rd, the dean texted me uh, to see if I could talk, um, and and he called me. Uh, we had a conversation. He said he was just giving me a, a heads up that there was a hit piece on me, that it was circulating in the university, that it was shared with the administration. I told him that uh, I had expected that Texas Scorecard was going to write a hit piece on me because there were already three FOIA requests on me. The, fo the first FOIA request pretty much gave Texas Scorecard everything from hiring material, my cover letter, my salary, syllabi, pretty much everything. The second two uh, requests wanted uh, emails, an archive of emails with keyword searches related to uh, Semitism, Jews, uh, Palestine. These were the keywords that decolonization uh, was another key term. And this archive was then going to be sent to a Texas Scorecard. They hadn't received the archive, so I assumed that when they published the hit piece, they could only draw on my my posts. I told the dean that I had expected it, and and uh, he said I could share the the article if I wanted to on on social media. That was my right, uh, but I of course said I I didn't want to give a far right media outlet more visibility than it deserves, um, and that's what um, I, I did. I I didn't share it, but what I did do. Uh, that same after after talking to him, I vaguely discussed that there were FOIA requests um, and that there was a hit piece from this uh, far right group uh, in Texas. Never shared the link because I didn't want to uh, do that, not because the dean um, had suggested it. In the afternoon, the dean um, the dean called me with a different tone, of course, and said, "I thought you weren't going to share the um, the hit piece or the article." And I said, I didn't. And, and he said, I will ask you, I want to ask you to take it down. And I said, out of eth my ethical commitment and out of principle, I will not um, take it down. And if there were, uh, there's going to be a consequence or if the higher ups or if the provost or the president or anyone's going to make a decision or if there's going to be consequences, I was clear to tell him that I was ready for the consequences. 10 days later, I received an email from uh, the president, uh, his not directly from him, but from his administrative assistant, uh, that I was suspended. It was 3.02 p.m. when I was suspended. Uh, at 3.29 p.m., they released a statement. Um, they released a statement that I want to uh, read here um, where they state, and this is a media, uh, this is a statement that was released to the local media um where i i'm not sure why this was released the letter was fine it didn't had it have any accusations it just stated the facts that they were going to investigate um you know if there was racial uh discrimination or harassment in the classroom but the statement that they released 20 minutes after i was suspended states assistant professor Jairo funes flores posted a series of social media comments that we find to be hateful anti-semitic and unacceptable. These social media comments are antithetical 
to our values, including those found in some system regulations or ethical conduct regulations that the university has. And then below in that same statement, it says the Office of Equal Opportunity will investigate whether any of the anti-Semitic sentiments expressed by Professor Funes Flores social media comments have found their way into the classroom or work environment. And I share this statement um, mainly because uh, the, the letter was uh, somewhat, I, I, I for some reason wasn't as shocked when I read the suspension letter. The statement, however, was came to a shock because I found out from a news reporter who wrote me on Twitter and said that they wanted to interview me. Um, and I was shocked by that because I didn't know that there was a, a media statement released so, so they could pretty much eat me alive in the local media and, and for reasons to scare me, to corner me, to silence me. And my response was a complete opposite. I immediately uh, posted it on, on Twitter. And my, my intention initially was to probably take a day off you know, maybe post the next day. But when the, the reporter reached out to me, I, I was, uh, of course, disturbed by the accusations. In, in more than the letter that didn't have direct accusations, the president and the chancellor made direct affirmations of my social media posts, um, qualifying them as anti-Semitic before initiating an investigation, right? And so, this is this is where the when I where I've shared in, in other occasions that it's more disturbing than the actual suspension, because in addition to my suspension, they are it's it's defamation, right? It's it's trying to discredit me in order to justify my suspension, and so this is where I've um, I'm at now. I've been working with uh, Fire, um, and of course this is. Uh, as as many have shared, it, it's we have to navigate that space carefully. But uh, Pal Legal has been uh, overwhelmed, as as many others have also shared. Pal Legal has many cases. I, I reached out to them; they reached out back, but um, they weren't able to take my case. But not because of merit, but because they 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 are overwhelmed. Um, to return to to the the statement, I want to um, have it, have everyone who's listening, if they could read the article. Um, from published on February 22nd by Texas Scorecard, the first thing that they refer to is the ethical conduct regulation of Texas Tech that my uh, my posts are do not correspond to those ethical conduct regulations. The very same thing that the statement released on March 4th by the president and the chancellor is identical to what that hit piece wrote. It's interesting how they begin in the same way and they cite the same regulations uh, to the first piece saying to fire me, the president and the chancellor, of course, suspended me and are uh, investigating whether my quote unquote anti-Semitic sentiments can be found in, in my in the classroom or work environment. So I, of course, we I don't want to. You know, this is not a conspiracy theory. It's just an uh, interesting coincidence that they're using the same language, the same regulations to justify um, my suspension. Um, that's uh, what I want to share now, but I, of course, have additional things to share uh, with the questions that will be asked uh, subsequently. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jairo. Uh, we actually do have questions, but I think we're going to ask uh, Maura to speak so that when we ask the questions, we can also go back and forth and, and make this uh, a bit more conversational. Um, let me introduce uh, Mara. Uh, I am uh, uh, just uh, to share that uh, very grateful that uh, both uh, Mara and uh, Jairo were very open about joining us and sharing their stories. Uh, I'm, we are indebted to them and we are in total support. Uh, I just want to express our gratitude for them. Um, Mara Finkelstein is a writer, ethnographer, and associate professor of anthropology. She is the author of the Archive of Loss, Lively Ruination in Mill Land, Mumbai, published by Duke University Press in 2019. Her writing has also appeared in anthropological, uh, sorry, in anthological quarterly, city and society, cultural anthropology, anthropology now, post forty five, electric literature, Allegra Lab, Red Pepper magazine, and the Scottish Left Review. I must say that for somebody coming from political science, these are really cool sounding titles of journals and publications. We don't have that kind of thing. So with that, Amara, the floor is yours.
point. Am I unmuted now? You're good. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, thank you, Bassem and Maryam. It's my great honor to be here today and a privilege to be speaking along Jairo. I'm zooming in from Lenape Hoking, the traditional lands of the Lenape and Delaware people. We're talking about Palestine today, but I understand that these movements are intertwined and that I'm a settler living on stolen land. I support decolonization movements, land back, and I stand in solidarity with everyone fighting for justice, liberation, and freedom across the world. So I'm going to start with some numbers. Since October 7th, at least 32,000 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces in Gaza, including at least 13,500 children. These numbers are probably an underestimation. At least 135 Palestinian journalists have been killed by Israeli forces. In addition to hundreds of university students, Israel has killed close to 100 academics. All or parts of Gaza's 12 universities have been bombed and mostly destroyed. Approximately 378 schools have been destroyed or damaged. At least 13 libraries have been destroyed. These numbers mean that Israel is destroying both the physical infrastructure of higher education in Gaza, as well as the intellectual infrastructure. We are here to talk about academic freedom. This destruction is not just an assault on pa Palestinian lives, it's an assault on Palestinian academic freedom. And so I start with these numbers because these numbers are what matter. These numbers are why we are all here. These numbers are people, and these people are why we cannot remain silent, no matter what the cost. Listen, <laughs> I do not want to lose my job. And if there are any administrators from my college here, I want to be very clear. I do not want to lose my job. I cannot afford to lose my job. But losing my job is insignificant in the face of genocide. I think it's absolutely critical that I and everyone else making sacrifices in the name of Palestinian liberation keep that in mind. We are here because institutions across the country are working hard to silent dissent. To badly quote Sarah Ahmed, apologies, once you draw attention to a problem, you become the problem. A lot of us have become the problem, but right now we all need to become the problem. I actually can't really speak to the specific details of my case because I'm under investigation, but what I can say, or at least what I hope I can say, is that I'm on administrative leave and under investigation. For the most part, this is because of what I've posted on social media, similar to Hiro. Like many, many people, I've been consistently and loudly calling out Israel's genocide in Gaza for the past six months, and actually the past 12 years of being a college professor. Um, and I've gotten a lot of attention for it. I can also say that none of this is new. Like many, many people, last semester there were numerous complaints made against me by students, alumni, and donors because of my teaching and publication. There was a petition calling for my dismissal, and the last time I checked, it had over 7,000 signatures. I do not know, but I imagine that my college is under a great amount of pressure from Zionist donors to have me fired. I've seen some of the letters, um, and I will say, and we can talk more about this in the Q&A, but I am Jewish. Most of the letters are from Jewish alum and donors, and they are calling me Nazi, <laughs> they're calling me capo. I've never received so much hate, and it's coming from other Jews. There are many of us who have been subjected to this. We're doing the work that we do because of the numbers I just read. We are doing the work that um, we are doing because we know that decolonization is not a metaphor. I'll speak to my specific discipline of anthropology because that is how I was trained, but I think that this is relevant for many of us, regardless of discipline. When I teach and write, I teach and write from a particular position, a particular situatedness. Following Black, Indigenous, queer, and feminist scholars, the anthropology I teach is invested in this kind of grounding. When I teach about Palestine, I teach the work of Palestinian scholars and writers and filmmakers. I teach from their location, from their perspective. This is not bias, even though that is what we are being accused of. This is the core methodology of my discipline, of many of our disciplines. I was hired as a scholar and teacher who engages the ethics and practices of a certain kind of training. And the way we are seeing scholars and teachers being sanctioned right now is in large part because they, because we, 
are doing our jobs. This is our job. We ask hard questions. We reveal the way power works, the way institutions work, the way collective social imagination is forged by the social, political, and economic conditions we live in. In the United States, that collective imagination is racist, it's colonial, it's capitalist, it's Zionist, it's homophobic, it's transphobic, to mention just a few forms of violent ideologies that consume us. Our jobs as scholars is to push at these edges. I teach at a liberal arts college. Our goal is to teach critical thinking skills. This is what critical thinking skills looks like. For those of us speaking and writing and teaching against genocide, we are literally doing our jobs. And for those of us that are being sanctioned or are being threatened with sanctions, we are modeling for our students the ethical practice of our theory and pedagogy. We are doing what we are doing because of who we are as scholars. We aren't just letting this be theory, we're making it into praxis. This is literally our job. We are being punished for doing our jobs. It's also really important to mention that while Palestine is the liberal exception in so many ways, this silencing, and I think we're going to talk about this more in a bit, but the silencing is part of a larger conservative project to shut down affirmative action in DEI, to attack critical race theory, to silence educators around queer issues like don't say gay. And I mean, just reading the news this morning in Alabama, there is an attempt to sanction all forms of divisive content, which is literally everything. If you don't teach about Palestine, but you do teach about the transatlantic slave trade. If you don't teach about Palestine, but you do teach about gender and sexuality. If you don't teach about Palestine, but you do teach about settler colonialism in the US or wherever your home country is. If you don't teach about Palestine, but you do teach about environmental degradation and colonial extraction. If you don't teach about Palestine, but you do teach about the history of scientific racism and on and on and on, then you are just as implicated in this moment. We really need to think about these sanctions, both in terms of the specific specificities of anti-Arab racism, Islamophobia, and Israel's exceptionalism in American politics, and also the general implications of all of our teaching and publication practices, which should be about resisting power and encouraging critical thinking. None of us are safe right now. The tools being used now will be used later to sanction the rest of us. And so we need a critical mass. We should all be teaching about Palestine in our classes. There is absolutely no subject or discipline in which this is not possible or relevant. Palestinians have been telling us that Israel has been guilty of genocide since 1948. And Gazans have been telling us exactly what they are living and dying through for the past six months. We should be listening to Palestinian voices. They are narrating to us their annihilation. But we live in a world that doesn't trust Palestinians. We live in a world that has been dehumanizing them for over a century. Because our institutions of power refuse to listen to Palestinians, let's have them listen to the ICJ, who ruled that there's plausible evidence that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. The ICJ is our institutional backing here. We all know this is genocide, not war, not conflict, genocide. We cannot let, we cannot let our institutions silence us right now. This is our job. It is our job to teach to help our students see the world in a way they've never been able or allowed to see the world before, to question this previously taken for granted world and to reimagine it through the material that we teach. This is what we do. Like many people, I've been removed from the classroom, not just because questioning a taken for granted world is uncomfortable work and many of our students are uncomfortable right now, as they should be, we should all be uncomfortable right now, but because this work is dangerous. It questions the status quo. It challenges the power of institutions, including the institutions we work at. It helps our students take what they think they know about the world and learn to see it differently, not through the lens of power, but through the lens of curiosity and imagination, as well as the critical grounded scholarship we offer them. So I'm not in the classroom right now. I'm still as loud as I can be though. And I want to end by returning to the numbers. I know because like so many of us, I'm way too online right now. We are all seeing these numbers. These days, like so many of us, I structure my life around these numbers. I keep my eye on these numbers because these numbers are people. I think it's important to highlight the artists and writers and scholars being systematically targeted and murdered by Israel because uh, the, this event is about academic freedom and the assault on intellectuals, the people who tell stories and bear witness. It's an assault on academic freedom but also every single one of the people who have been murdered in Gaza is a whole world. 
regardless of how they lived and what they were able to do or not do with their lives. And so when we make decisions to speak up or stay silent, I hope we are all thinking about the people in Gaza, those who are dead, those who are dying, and those who may survive. We cannot be quiet right now. We all owe them our voice. Um, I will stop there for now and we can have a discussion. Thank you, uh, Mara. I know this is not uh, easy for for everyone. Um, let me uh, let us start the uh, conversation, uh, and we agreed to have this in conversation format. So please feel free to jump in uh, if you need to. Uh, I'll start with a, a question for um, Hiro, and uh, we can uh, also uh, go back. And I think you're muted, Bassam. Expanding our uh, perspective a bit, uh, Jairo, if, we, if you can tell us a little bit about uh, the institutional setting and what you think are the main reasons uh, universities in the US are under attack uh, and how do you understand these attacks uh, in a historical perspective uh, sociopolitically as well as ideologically. Thank you, uh, Basam, for that question. Um, we'll see how how long I, I have or I can take uh, to answer this question. Please uh, signal me. Um, I, I have a few notes here um, that that I want to share. So it is, I th you know, this question uh, hints at at the the importance of of historicizing. Um, universities as modern colonial institutions to situate uh, universities uh, within colonial contexts. Um, and the reason it's important to historicize them is so we, we, we disrupt this romanticization of, of higher education. Of course, there's moments uh, where, where there's more attacks than there were, uh, let's say, five years ago, 10 years ago. But we have to also remind ourselves that Western universities um, have uh, these modern colonial uh, foundations. And, and, and in fact, uh, universities have served uh, as a major pillar of, of domination and, and exploitation, whether it was by uh, designing a curriculum uh, aligned to the political and economic interests or cultural and ideological interests. Uh, Western universities have justified uh, displacement in the past and present and have rationalized uh, racial colonial violence, but it's also it's also important to recognize that universities don't only justify domination or ide ideologically justify uh, domination uh, through their philosophies and 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 theories. Uh, we can go back to to many philosophers and name them right um, and see what they actually wrote about and how they justified colonization. But universities also actively participate in. Uh, colonial dispossession. And we can see this, for instance, to be very specific, we could see this with the Secretary of Defense contracts or research and development projects uh, linked uh, to technological advancement uh, designed for exploitation, dispossession, surveillance, and of course, war. Uh, Howard University is a recent case. Uh, they received millions of dollars, a million dollar contract, million, I think 90 million perhaps, in an effort to diversify, let's say, quote unquote, diversify STEM fields linked to national security, uh, and perhaps here we can recall Angela Davis's uh, notion of the democratization of racism. And in this case, we're seeing the uh, democratization of colonial imperial uh, domination. Uh, when we also historicize, uh, uh, on the other hand, when we historicize the small gains, the small changes uh, that have been made inside universities in terms of curriculum or governance, we must also realize that it is because of social movements, social struggles. We can go back to the student activist student movements in the 1960s who, create, who created the Third World Liberation Front. And their intention wasn't, was what their intention was at first to, to align their pedagogical and political project with decolonization and liberation movements in what we now know as, as a global South. And it is because of their struggle that we have ethnic studies programs, although uh, their, their intention wasn't necessarily to have programs situated within specific uh, disciplines. Um, 
or attached to a specific discipline, but rather to structurally change the university by creating a third world college. What I'm trying to say uh, by all this is, is that the sociopolitical context uh, creates the material conditions for alternative knowledge practices to emerge or for reactionary movements to unfold as we're seeing today uh, in the US or in other Western, uh, Western countries. The current sociopolitical landscape uh, in which social movements have re-emerged um, has positioned dissident voices and radical programs and theories within academia as potential threats to dominant interests. And this leads me to, to answer or try to answer the second part of, of the question in relation to uh, why universities are being attacked. Uh, universities uh, have, as I mentioned already, have been uh, sites of contestation. And when social movements and massive protests or organizing happens at unprecedented levels, as we saw with the Black Lives Matter movement and the reactionary backlash or white lash uh, against uh, critical race theory, uh, we're seeing the same thing with Palestinian, pro-Palestinian and anti-Zionist faculty and students um, who have not only spoken out against the genocide in Gaza, where nearly one out of 20 Palestinians have been killed and or injured, uh, and millions have been starved and displaced by Israel. But they have also these same faculty and students are not only speaking out, but they're also organizing faculty and students for justice in Palestine chapters and have started to actively participate in organizational work uh, beyond the university. And so within this shifting uh, sociopolitical landscape, uh, we're seeing a second, we, what we could consider a second reactionary wave, the first being, uh, and we're still within the same wave, um, hasn't receded by any means, the first wave being against CRT and other, and the second wave being against decolonization and everything that relates to the Palestinian struggle. So related to what, what may be discussed later um, is that there is, a, there is not only a dangerous conflation uh, between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, but decolonization and liberation movements are also being portrayed as inherently genocidal, as we've seen in the media, as we've seen also uh, Elon Musk uh, referring to decolonization, uh, referring to the Palestinian struggle, uh, others have also mentioned, as inherently genocidal. In this sense, it is not settler colonialism that is predicated on ethnic cleansing, uh, genocidal violence, racism, and territorial expansion. Instead, it's anti-colonial struggles that are painted as savagery, right? And we also know that this term has a colonial genealogy. And that's why some of the dissident voices uh, who know too well um, how discourse shapes action have challenged the portrayal of Palestinians uh, as human animals or as children of darkness that must be eradicated by the children of light. Politically committed uh, anti-colonial and decolonial scholars, however, have been challenging these dangerous narratives and discourses for a while now. So when they're, they're used against Palestinians or any other dominated group, our responsibility, our ethical commitment uh, is to disrupt uh, the naturalization of this colonial and racial rhetoric that justifies uh, incalculable death and destruction with dominant discourses uh, increasingly being challenged within and beyond academia um, and through collective action. And when we recognize uh, the colonial projects and capitalist interests uh, universities serve, uh, it becomes easier to understand uh, why they easily succumb to external pressure and perhaps um, using this uh, dichotomy of external and, and internal is, is not adequate given that universities are constitutive of uh, colonial and capitalist projects. Um, we understand, I think, um, by, by, by situating it in such a way that the small pockets of insurgent voices do have the potential to articulate uh, themselves into a broad-based social movement, and this is uh, indeed a threat. Um, to, to conclude, I, I think it's, it's precisely because uh, academics um, have historically done more to reproduce systems of coordinated uh, uh, attack on dissonant voices within our current context. One thing that gives me hope, uh, despite everything, however, is, is, is that billionaires, politicians, uh, uh, mainstream media do in fact see us as a threat. Uh, and they spend time and money to discredit us and our political commitments and projects. And we must realize uh, that we are living within a specific conjuncture uh, that demands 
uh, that we double down uh, on our collective efforts rather than succumb to their pressures. Uh, because the intention here uh, is to create a culture of fear, of silence, of complicity. And we must realize that there is a real fear of our collective efforts in, in a neoliberal world uh, that values um, only possessive individualism. Uh, there's a real fear that our collective efforts uh, will permanently unmask uh, what liberal institutions have always represented. And ultimately, there is a real fear of what, what can be achieved um, when intellectual work remains steadfast uh, and fearless, um, that neither suspensions or defamation will silence us, that will that we'll continue um, not only to speak out against genocide and settler colonial dispossession, uh, but also organize uh, within and beyond academia. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, but thank you so much, uh, first of all, to both Mara and Jairo for laying out your cases and laying out your analysis, your very sharp analysis of how all of these, um, you know, systems are, are operating in, in this particular way to make it appear as if it's kind of this one sided and the work that, that you all are doing and so many others are doing to resist kind of the application of, uh, you know, mischaracterization on our work on our scholarship, on our teaching, um, and on, on our words on, on social media and other spaces where we may choose to speak. And so um, on that, I wanted to turn uh, to Mara to ask a little bit more about, I mean, you talked in your in your comments about this kind of application of, of what is a divisive concept and this particular way of kind of conflating, um, you know, uh, legitimate uh, reasons to, to kind of, you know, address divisive concepts that, that seek to kind of, uh, you know, re reinforce hierarchy versus these which are actually co-opting that language to actually produce this kind of silencing. And so if you could talk a little bit about how specifically anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are being weaponized and collapsed right now and conflated, and what is the work that we can be doing to resist this? And perhaps if you can speak specifically about your position um, as a Jewish academic of how to resist this collapse within the university and especially the policies that we're seeing these days. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, so one of the things that I am so unsettled in seeing is not just the collapse of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, which I'll talk a little bit about, but also the centering of anti-Semitism as like our current like largest global threat, which, you know, anti-Semitism is on the rise as is Islamophobia. And I think that in centering anti-Semitism, we're, we're sort of seeing that work being done as a way of um, sort of weaponizing anti-Semitism in the name of Islamophobia. And so, you know, anti-Zionism is actually a Jewish ideology, ideological construction. It came from within Jews who were in opposition to the Zionist project, who for religious or ethical or political reasons did not support the Zionist project. And what we're seeing across the country and specifically within our colleges and universities is that this weaponization of anti-Semitism as anti-Zionism is actually coming from the right. And, you know, I, I mentioned this briefly, but we're seeing the same long-term attacks on um, affirmative action on DEI. There is a Heritage Foundation report from a few years ago that I think is one of the sort of foundational documents that's, um, you know, putting Hiro and I in this position in which our social media feeds are being categorized as anti-Semitic and also being linked to our professional life, in which the Heritage Foundation looked through hundreds of tweets by DEI staff and faculty and was flagging everything that was critical of Israel and coding it as anti-Semitic, even when the people who were tweeting were Jewish. So they were really putting in this foundation in which Jews who were identifying as anti-Zionist Jews were 
being called anti-Semitic. And we're also being um, sort of framed in a way that was dangerous for Jewish students on, on campus. And so we're sort of seeing how this is being enacted now in the way that faculty who are you know, speaking out, especially on social media, where there's sort of this ambiguous academic freedom space. You know, last semester, my teaching and my publications were in question. This semester, it's entirely about my social media and my social media being framed as an attack on Zionists and therefore anti-Semitic. And I think we're seeing a lot of people who are following falling into this regardless of their um, identity. And so I think one of the things that I have been working hard to unlearn and sort of, you know, be vocal about over the past 30 years of my life since I was a teenager is to unlearn Zionism, which we're all sort of seeped in in the United States, and also understand that Zionism is something that uses Jews in a way that is actually anti-Semitic. It is the idea that Jews aren't safe anywhere unless there's is there's Israel as a place where you know the West can export their Jews if they don't want to deal with them. And also this idea that a genocidal state represents the Jewish people. Both of these things are bad for Jews. But you know we're thinking about how it is to exist in power. And so what I'm seeing, the attacks that I'm receiving are almost entirely from other Jews who also identify as Zionists and who are you know telling me that i'm not jewish and i think that because of the way this sort of identity politics is being played out in this really political way it's actually absolutely critical that jewish academics be very loud in opposition to zionism and in opposition of israel's genocide we should not be centering ourselves but we should be doing absolutely everything that we can right now to oppose israel to make sure that we are not aligning ourselves with Israel in any way and to speak out in the name of Palestinian freedom from the river to the sea. And, you know, I think that if there is any sense of, you know, justice or asking questions, we're coming up on Passover soon. Passover is all about liberation and it's all about how being Jewish is about asking questions. The most Jewish thing that I can imagine doing right now is opposing Israel speaking out against Israel's genocide in Gaza and, and platforming Palestinians who can, you know, tell their own stories. And we need to do this work because in collapsing anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, it's not just bad for Palestinians and for everybody else. It's actually very bad for Jews. It's very dangerous. And it is a conservative project to shut down um, equity work on campuses. We should all be very afraid of it right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Um, um, I have so many questions and uh, I know that Maliam does as well, um, but we don't want to keep you too long um, and keep everyone here too long. Um, so I'll, I'll move to uh, a question that uh, is based on Jairo's experience with the uh, the suspension and some of the implications, especially since uh, the suspension took place. If you can share with us, uh, Jairo, because we know this is going to be ongoing. And luckily, we have um, literally dozens, if not hundreds of organizations um, in support of these uh, methods and efforts and campaigns to silence. Um, so in the meantime, if you can share with us uh, what some of the key things are uh, regarding what faculty should know about uh, academic freedom and free speech, uh, as well as what happens after in terms of due process, uh, given your experience. Thank you, Bassam, for, uh, for that question. Um, if I'm going to be honest, um, you know, if many of the the regulations that uh institutions have i was ignorant about I, I i didn't think about reading them beforehand um and and i think this is you know this base here serves as a as as like a public pedagogy or or political education in, in many ways for faculty who are speaking out but perhaps never cared to look at their own 
uh, policies, their own regulations, uh, what AAUP is and what statements have been published in the past, how universities have signed those regulations and need to uphold those regulations. And this is the, I think for the most part, this is what I've learned since my suspension. Uh, it's been a, a learning experience, let's say. Uh, I've read all the policies, read all the guidelines, the ethical conduct and so on and so forth, as well as many of the AAUP uh, regulations. So I wanted to share, uh, let's see if I could share my screen. I'm not sure if I, I'll, I'll be able to figure it out. That's okay. I, I'm gonna look at, uh, one of the letters, and that's public, can, by the way. You can try uh, if. Okay, let's see. I tried right now, and I'm not able to see if a, you're a tab for some reason. It's okay. Um, so there is um, AAUP uh, at the national and state Texas one. Uh, the national uh, AAUP, the uh, American Association of University Professors, um, they wrote a letter to. Um, to the university and and i'm sharing this is so uh, for others who are listening or uh for others who will view later uh, that they need to uh, also investigate and learn what these statements are and so in this letter uh they cite or they state the following it says the aaup's opposition to punishing academics for their expressions as citizens rather than scholars dates back to the 1940 statements of principles uh which asserts the following College and university teachers are citizens, members of a learned uh, community or profession and officers of an education institution. When they speak or write as citizens, they should be free from institutional censorship or discipline. But their special position in the community also imposes uh, special obligations. As scholars and educational officers, they should remember that the public may judge their profession and their institution by their utterances. Furthermore, it states, however, and, and it, it clarifies these points, if the administration of a college or a university feels that a teacher has not observed the admonitions uh, of paragraph three of the section on academic freedom and believes that the extramural utterances of the teacher have been such as to raise grave doubts concerning the teacher's fitness for his or her position, it may proceed to file charges under paragraph four of the section on academic tenure. In pressing such charges, the administration should remember that teachers are citizens and should be accorded the freedom of, cit of citizens. And the controlling principle is that a faculty member's expression of opinion as a citizen cannot constitute grounds for dismissal unless it clearly demonstrates that the faculty member's unfitness for his or her position, extramural, Utterances rarely bear upon the faculty member's fitness for the position. Moreover, a final decision should take into account for faculty member's entire record as a teacher and scholar. And the reason I share this is because uh, it, it's it's not only related to free speech of what we need to know, what rights we have. And in many interviews, I've been repeating and kind of using the language of as a citizen, I have the right to do this. I don't tend to use the word citizen. Of course, we could critique even the notion of what a uh, citizenship uh, is, right? I'm an, I, I grew up uh, undocumented uh, as an undocumented immigrant in the United States for it. I was eight, undocumented for 18 years, but nonetheless, we have to use this language at times uh, and play uh, this this game and, 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 and the regulations that the university has also signed. And I also share this because the university, before initiating an investigation, as I mentioned before, accused me of anti-Semitism. It didn't follow the due process. I'm not sure if there's a third party, and I can't get into the specifics, but from the, from the information I have, uh, all I know is based on the statement that they released is that they specify only my social media posts, accuse me of anti-Semitism uh, based on my critiques of Israel, and then state that they're going to initiate an investigation. Now, the due process states that there needs to be a third party. And this is what faculty need to know, especially pro-Palestinian scholars, Palestinian scholars. We need to know that there's due process, that the university has certain protocols that it needs to follow, um, and that a third party complaint is a student or an, another faculty member, right? And so, or perhaps someone else, perhaps admin, I'm not sure. In this case, it was unilateral. It was a decision. Um, determined by the president and the chancellor, and now the Office of Equal Opportunity are investigating. Now, the Office of Equal Opportunity 
Did they have to follow a specific protocol? Have things changed under the new SB 18 bill that was signed into law last year? That I'm not completely uh, aware of, but based on the regulations that AAUP uh, has shared and has written in there and has also quoted in their letters, I have learned that the university is in violation of due process, right? And that I've also learned uh, what uh, what rights as, as a professor, as a quote unquote citizen, I have uh, to express myself and to be able to critique. And as, 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 as Maura also mentioned, our responsibility, our political commitment, our ethical commitments is to be able to critique uh, nation states. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I, um, I also looked up the, the law on anti-Semitism or what definition the state uh, of Texas upholds, and it, it, and it also, uh, I think it cites uh, the, 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 that anti-Semitism should not uh, be equated to uh, the critique of, of Israel. So uh, it's interesting to, to note that I was suspended based on these baseless accusations from uh, Texas scorecard that the administration, in this case, the president and the chancellor, um, pretty much uh, state the same thing as as the hit piece published on February 20, 22nd. And now, uh, of course, I've been under investigation for over two weeks now. So um, research um, and know how to defend yourself when uh, these accusations uh, come your way. Um, that's all I have for now. Thank you so much, Jairo, um, for laying that out and for kind of uh, reminding us that it's important to learn these policies and, and read these policies more closely, um, especially as we're engaging in this work. Um, and I, I really appreciate that attention to, again, like, while on the one hand policy is being kind of operationalized, weaponized, it also is the, the site for us to pay attention to and to kind of push back on. Um, and so uh, I'm going to now turn uh, to Mara and ask, um, you know, what I really appreciated about your comments, um, you know, was was sharing um, that, you know, these are not just numbers that, you know, what we're sitting with and what we're looking at every single day is something that we need to, you know, um, pay this, this particular kind of critical attention to and kind of think with as we're doing um, work within the university. And so the question is, um, how can those of us who are not Palestinian continue to engage in this moment? Where should our energies be uh, put? Um, what does solidarity look like? Especially I think uh, so for so many uh, people who are on college campuses, what are some of the ways that we can do that? We have so many good examples around us, but if you could tell us a few uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And I'll start that this by saying, I am learning, I'm still learning, I haven't figured this out. And I'm really grateful for everyone who has been teaching me and who has been like gently calling me out and calling me in. Um, I expect that that will be happening my entire life. And I'm very gr grateful for that. So, you know, what I'm going to say is not, you know, 100%, you know, the answer for everyone. And I also appreciate feedback to, you know, help me be um, a better ally. But I would say that the most important thing that we can be doing right now is platforming Palestinian voices. There are Palestinian scholars, writers, poets, filmmakers, artists, um, Palestinians on social media, journalists. And I think that in our classroom, we should be, you know, teaching Palestinian uh, scholars. Um, when we are consuming media, we should be looking towards, you know, Palestinian um, journalists, outlets that are platforming Palestinian voices. I think that there is a lot of work that needs to be done in this country to unlearn the incredible distrust and unbelievability of Palestinians to tell their own story, to narrate their own history, to narrate their own experience. If you look at the way in which Palestinians are being silenced in this country and the way that Israel is silencing Palestinians by actually murdering them, what we really need to do is be platforming Palestinian voices and um, telling, uh, helping Palestinians tell their own stories by teaching and reading and, and et cetera, et cetera. And I think, you know, I feel very strongly about this. I acknowledge that I'm a tenured professor. Apparently that doesn't really mean anything anymore, but I've been an adjunct. I've been a contingent faculty member. I was untenured um, for many years. And I, you know, 
up until recently, I thought being Jewish protected me in a particular kind of way, but I've been trying to do this work for my entire career. And so I do acknowledge that there are people in, you know, precarious uh, contexts, uh, you know, TAs, uh, grad students, contingent faculty, but I think we need a critical mass. We cannot have, you know, people sort of feeling as though it is too dangerous to be doing this critical work right now. It's really, in, from my perspective, nothing that is more important than this. And so if we saw across disciplines, across rank, a really, you know, organized collective move to be centering Palestine right now and specifically centering Palestinian voices. I don't you know, necessarily think that that would end the genocide, but I do think that that could help us not just draw attention away from the few people who are very, very visible right now, but also perhaps have a really powerful impact on our students who are desperate for this information. And it is our obligation, it's our job to help them find that information. Um, and I think platforming Palestinian voices is the way to be doing that right now. Thanks. Uh, thanks to both of you uh, for uh, all the insights. There are a lot of comments that we are um, getting uh, so much encouragement for uh for both of you and honestly for for everyone who's in the situation as we all know this is not uh, a new development uh for many many years there have been people that have been censured suspended notably the case of Stephen Salaita but many many others as well who have been under pressure um in a way that uh, is honestly unfathomable given that the same things for which people are uh censured are actually okay and totally legitimate to say right uh or even uh you know address uh publicly or on, or, or on social media so this is certainly ground for us to keep going we have uh, a few more minutes i'm hoping that um, it is okay with you Hiro and uh, Mara to stay with us i also want to say that uh, we are potentially able to take a question or two uh, from uh, the audience, if you can just add the word question right before you address things. And we are focusing mostly on YouTube uh, because uh, this is where we have been uh, monitoring, monitoring the question given the questions, given that the uh, Twitter feed uh, is actually um, uh, varied. So there are like many different uh, links. So, um, I wanted us to to go to uh, a broader set of uh, issues that have to do with um, uh, with you know the, honestly the, the the bigger picture something that uh, we have been talking about uh, uh, regarding uh, a number of dimensions including um, pressure to actually affect curriculum, whether it's internal or legal, in other words, within the administration uh, of a particular university regarding Palestine or uh, things that are happening in terms of legislation, uh, as well as the impact that uh, donors and uh, boards of visitors have. And uh, I'd like us to start there if you have any comments on either and if you've had any kind of um, uh, connection or relationship uh, with uh, uh, anyone who uh, is able to uh, or was able to share with you, uh, you know, any meaningful information, especially regarding your case. So I'll open this up uh, for all of us and also for uh, Mariam, whom, um, who's uh, my co-moderator, who, um, you know, also herself has had, has had some experience uh, with uh, with some of this um, harassment, and I'll, I'll leave it up to her to address them. But this is uh, an open floor to address these two important points, because it seems that this is where um, things become consequential. In other words, uh, faculty, colleagues, and administration, uh, administrative uh, officials can do and say a lot, but when it comes from, quote unquote, uh, higher up, uh, things become consequential. So. Hyra or Maura or Mariam, feel free to jump in. I 
I mean, I don't, I can't say too much about this, but I think that this is a really, you know, to go to a utopian, utopian vision of the future. I mean, I think that this is pointing exactly to why higher education should be free. I teach at a small college, it's a private college. And um, what I'm seeing now is the power of donors. Um, you know, when it's a tuition driven institution and a donor driven institution, we are service providers. And the people who are pouring money into our institutions are positioned in a way because of capitalism to be able to control the product. And, you know, so from my perspective, I think that this is a really powerful call to why public education is so important, why education should be free, uh, why the government should be, you know, supporting um, higher education and the model that we have as a capitalist model is going to inevitably put us in this position over and over and over again. No, I agree, um, Mara. I mean, I'm. I think uh, when we, you know, situate these institutions um, and just the policies that have been in place uh, at least since the '70s, '80s, uh, with the neoliberalization of higher education, um, we've seen this roll back, roll roll out kind of policies where you know, kind of defund the universities, depend more heavily on 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 donations or donors. Um, so on and so forth, um, but for, uh, what I what I believe um, here is that within this specific context, I'm not sure if without the mobilization, without the movement building, without um, without that, without the shifting social political context, I don't I don't think that higher education, the the CRT, whether it's CRT or whether it's decolonial, anti-colonial thought, would be perceived as, as such a threat, right? And so I I want to situate it with within the socio political context where people are 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 tired of of being silent, right? Of course, not everyone. We do see uh, colleagues who um, who remain silent, uh, who uh, want to aspire uh for the rewards who wants to move up in administration who uh do not side uh with those who are suspended uh like you and i as as, as we've probably seen in our cases uh and if any colleagues are listening thank you for joining uh, uh and thank you for your support if you are supporting uh and so i think this is uh this is what what i'm seeing is that higher education the restructuring of education not only higher education uh, it's 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 to disrupt or to uh, eliminate all the small gains that have been made and through struggle in the past. All radical theories that we we could think of that have made their way into K to twelve education, that have made their way in higher education, is through struggle. It's never been a top down decision. It has uh, emerged from the grassroots. When uh, we see a shifting socio political landscape with with more movements uh, after George Floyd was murdered, uh, with the mass protests um, against the genocide. Then we also see the potential threat, as I mentioned initially, of this alignment of, of radical scholars uh, and committed intellectuals uh, committed to these struggles as well. And I think that's where the perceived threat is, but it's also facilitated that we already have a higher education structure that is highly dependent on uh, corporate interests. So this is where, where I'm trying to think about not only the gains that we've made, but the gains that are slowly being stripped away at times, but in, in recent years, these gains have been stripped away um, fairly rapidly. Thank you both so much for um, for kind of laying out again, like some of the dimensions that we need to be considering as we're having this conversation. And I think, um, thinking about kind of the struggle that has produced the conditions such that we have been able to do the kind of work that we've been able to do, even as it has been oftentimes very small gains. And it's always been a little bit of a struggle, whether you're in the position of being an undergraduate student or a graduate student or, you know, um, within the faculty as a postdoc. Um, and so along those lines, um, what 
what could we do to, I guess, protect people who are situated in different locations within the structure of the university? Um, we have a question from an audience uh, member, Philippa, of how to protect adjuncts. Um, and she says, uh, I was let go, taken off the schedule and had no redress because I had the term occupied Palestine in my course description. So, you know, there are so many of us within different parts of the university doing this work. And, and actually, thank you, uh, Bassam, for, for kind of uh, calling attention to my own experience, which is, you know, I was previously in a tenure track position for five years and um, was targeted uh, through uh, media groups uh, similar to what Jairo uh, explained. Um, and so, you know, we're all now in this kind of vulnerable situation where we're just doing our job, as Maura, you said, you know, we're doing the work that we have been hired specifically to do to teach these courses. And then there's this this policing. So what can we do within the university? What are your thoughts? What direction should we move in to protect those who are more those of us who are more vulnerably uh, located in the system? As as everyone is uh thinking about addressing this, uh, I am adding a uh, email for those uh, people who wish to share with us uh, information about uh, anything related to this conversation, whether it's personal or um, something that you feel is constructive and productive, um, or if it's a case, uh, provided that it's okay to, to be uh, you know shared, please feel free to email at SC, uh, SC as in steering committee, at palestineincontext.org, which is also palestineincontext.org, where you will be able to find all the conversations uh, that this series will produce. It's a one place where you can just go later and find it, although you can go to the uh, Twitter feed or Jadalia feed, specifically Jadalia feed on YouTube and find it, but uh, this is where it will uh, live uh, on palestineincontext.org, and uh, you'll be able to find everything else that the Gaza and Context Collaborative Teaching Project produces, which is now about, you know, more than 40 teachings and uh, webinars that uh, we have there. So, uh, Jairo and Maura, if you can share with us any uh, feedback on this very important question, which is frankly, as far as I'm concerned and Mariam is concerned, was one of, uh, was a major impetus for us uh, to do this, which is, you know, addressing the most vulnerable uh, among uh, mm -hmm. the faculty. I mean, I think that, you know, we need unions. I think that that's, you know, first and foremost, something that we should be pushing for across um, college and university campuses and supporting wherever we find them. And I also think that, you know, in the way that it is our job to unlearn a lot of the sort of isms and help our students unlearn a lot of the isms we and I mean collectively with higher education we like to pretend that um, this is you know um, a field in which you know you deserve the job that you have and actually that's not <laughs> how things work at all and I think that the way in which um, we allow for the hierarchies of faculty and staff to exist in colleges and universities sort of uh, pushes forward this idea of disposability in terms of the way that adjuncts and other contingent faculty are being treated and I think that if we sort of stop pretending as though these hierarchies mean ever anything other than the enforcement of how institutions want to control us and we can think much more collectively and we can think about how you know what does it mean for tenured professors to actually like place themselves in a way that is you know coming from a place of solidarity in you know, between contingent faculty and the administration? What does it mean to actually start thinking about how the theories that we teach are actually things that we need to be putting into practice, not just on a sort of, you know, national and global stage, but in our actual institutions and thinking about how, you know, we have these hierarchies in place because they serve the institution, but they actually don't serve us at all. And for to at least in the fantasy of higher education, have some kind of, you know, um, uh, job security, uh, thinking about what it means to 
you know, offer ourselves up to less um, secure faculty as a way of moving towards, you know, unionization. And, and I think, that, you know, one of the things that I've seen as a former adjunct who was part of a unionization push is that, you know, when, uh, you know, contingent faculty ask for things, the institution sets it up so that that means that, you know, tenured and tenure tracked faculty are being told that they're going to lose things. And that is a tool of the institution. How do we think more collectively? I think we need to be thinking more collectively, whether it be unionization or other um, forms of collective action. And I completely agree. I, I haven't, I don't have much to add uh, in terms of, of uh, unionization. I think Maura did an excellent job uh, covering all that. I, going back to some of the things that I mentioned, um, being involved in, or at least knowing um, what, what policies are in place or what organizations are in place uh, at your institution, um, whether it's AAUP or whether it's, you know, FJP, uh, being involved and being in contact with, with other professors, other faculty um, who are more committed. Uh, at times we could be uh, isolated or, or contingent faculty are, or, are overburdened by uh, the course uh, work that they, ha they have to cover. Uh, so being involved uh, in other collective efforts perhaps is an initial step. Um, but the responsibility uh, uh, is not only theirs, it's, it's also tenure track professors and also uh, tenure professors as Maura, Maura stated. And what I've seen, uh, the key difference, uh, uh, my work, my, my research uh, has highly focused on Latin American autonomous universities uh, and the role that uh, student movements uh, have historically played in creating a very politicized uh, institution uh, where uh, students and faculty have uh, equal decision-making power in the governance structure. And so at all levels, and I don't think that exists in the US. So if there's a big push or if this is the moment uh, to radically democratize higher education, it's now. Um, because in the, in the US, we could fight for small gains uh, with curriculum or content and, 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 and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, the governance structure remains hierarchical. And, and when, these programs are no longer uh, beneficial, they get rid of them. When f more radical faculty are no longer needed, they get rid of them. So if, 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 if through additional chapters as FJP or if AAUP becomes a little bit more radical, then there is, there are, we can establish at least the conditions of possibility to disrupt the hierarchical foundations of the governance structure that's in place. That's where I, I think the difference is when, when I think about the radical politicization or the political, let's say, to use a uh, the, the political structure in place that students fought for within the institutions in, in Latin America, it's extremely more radical. And so, how do we learn from other models that are that that exist elsewhere? Autonomous universities being one of them, and how do we use similar projects or, or probably move forward some similar projects uh, within the U.S. institution? Perhaps I don't have the solutions, but I think it's it's thinking of those alternative models uh, is is the first step. Thanks, Jairo. Um, we are running up to the end of our conversation, and uh, I know that a lot of people probably have uh, a lot more to share. Uh, we apologize that we are not going to be able to take all the questions. We have upwards of 1,500 people viewing this, so we know that the support is um, solid and pretty broad, and it's not just, you know, uh, uh, a lot of individuals, but also a lot of organizations. So we intend to continue speaking uh, on this matter, and we intend to... Um, uh, more uh, guests who can share with us and shed light on uh, their experiences and what uh, what we can do, what organizations can do, and honestly, how to uh, deal with uh, such situations. In fact, one of the things uh, we have been wanting to do for quite some time, uh, and thanks to the DMV uh, faculty uh, network, as well as FJP network, and everyone that is collaborating with Gaza and Context and the Mesa Task Force, um, 
we are, or a number of people and organizations are producing um, uh, documents that aid in this process. Uh, I personally uh, would like to share at some point uh, uh, and add to the list the kinds of things that uh, one can be proactive about based on like everyone else, listening and hearing and speaking with people, uh, there are certain things that uh, are considered low-hanging fruit for those who want to silence speech on Palestine. Uh, they're easy to avoid without compromising an iota of the substance you would like to share. But, you know, uh, these kinds of things uh, uh, are not intuitive. And uh, I think it's worthwhile to address them. And I think we will be uh, doing more tactical, you know, uh, sort of conversations in the weeks to come. Um, I would like to thank all of you uh, for joining and for being uh, as courageous as you are, because that inspires all of us. And the one thing to take as far as many are concerned, as far as I'm concerned, is that uh, we are strong. This is not, uh, you know, uh, even if uh, we're being maltreated and, um, uh, you know, um, defamed and so on. We're, we're, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not weak. Uh, we're not uh, limited to a few individuals and a few organizations. This is something that is a long journey and, uh, we all have what it takes in terms of individuals and institutions to address this, uh, in a very powerful way. And we have on our side, honestly, besides very basic questions of, you know, rules and decency and um, uh, regulations. We have a uh, remarkable generation uh, that that will not take this. And, and they are fully in support of what we have been doing. In fact, uh, there are some questions about students and their activism and how instead of us trying to protect them, they are also uh, mobilizing to protect us uh, who are members of the faculty. So this is this is really uh, powerful stuff. Um, Mariam, uh, before I ask uh, Maura and um, Hyro if they would like to uh, conclude with any last comments, would you like to share anything? Thank you. Um, I just want to say, uh, just express my gratitude um, to, to you, Basam, to the DMV faculty for kind of organizing this, to the groups that have supported us, to both Hyro and Mora. Um, I can only echo, I think, uh, Basam's comments that we are strong um, and we are strong when we are together. And so, uh, and also thank you so much to the students who are watching and who have been so supportive. Um, in my own experience, I think the student support was the most uh, heartening moment of the whole uh, experience. And so um, I just want to kind of appreciate everyone who is showing up right now and to keep showing up because we will be, we will all keep showing up and that's how we'll keep doing this work. Mara and uh, Jairo, you're, you're the, um, you know, you're the uh, center of attention here, and we would love to hear any last words, uh, including um, including um, things that you feel, and feel free to be, uh, you know, blunt about this, that you feel people can do uh, for you, as well as for people who are in similar situations. Yeah, I, I'd like to just echo um, Mariam's uh, comment about students and also the comments that our, uh, the viewers have also shared is that students are, um, as always, uh, and interestingly enough, they're, they're leading the way. And this is, I find it interesting because my research has focused on that and I never expected it to then come back to my institution. Uh, we're doing a critical ethnography with student movements uh, in Honduras and then um, having student movements, the FJP, organize a protest uh, on my campus. I'm really grateful uh, uh, to students uh, and, and it is students uh, that uh, we're learning from. Uh, and that's, um, I, I completely believe that. And I wanna echo also uh, sociologist uh, Rhonda Fata's uh, statement um, that we have to move past uh, uh, this performative, uh, this performative uh, solidarity, uh, this behind the scene uh, solidarity of concern, uh, but it's never really material. Uh, and that we have to be ready to um, risk a few things where we have to be ready to make sacrifices. 
And at times we also have to be ready to uh, sacrifice our careers if necessary. And Mora uh, mentioned this as well, that it pales in comparison if there are consequences as I've, as I've also shared with administration, if there's there's consequences uh, that we're ready for them. And it is that, I think that fearlessness um, within this moment uh, that is much of a concern and that is perceived as a threat. And I think we just have to mo keep moving forward um, uh, collectively. Thank you. I think you all have said everything perfectly. And so the only thing I would like to echo is that I know that there are students from my college, from Muhlenberg, who are watching in the audience or who will watch later. And um, I miss you desperately and I love you and I'm glad you're here. And I know that you're doing the work even though I can't see it. And I'm really proud of all of you and all of the students who are risking so much um, for the actions and the solidarity work that they're doing. Um, I'm in incredibly humbled to, to be part of this larger network. Ahlan wa sahlan again, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Uh, thanks, Mariam, for co-hosting and uh, sharing some of your own experience. Maybe we'll talk more about it in the future if you are um, uh, with us and willing. Uh, and uh, as in willing, because you're my co-host, so I hope you will stay with us. Uh, Jairo, thank you so much. Um, you you were uh, so remarkable when I when I first gave you a call. And I thought you're going, you're going to be, you know, doubtful or, you know, who is this guy? And uh, you were just a pleasure to speak with um, and um, uh, inspired us to, to keep going with this. And Maura, same thing. You were so open and um, uh, so open spirited and free spirited and allowed us to feel confident about this. And uh, your voices, honestly, are so important, not just in and of themselves, but also for the kind of um, encouragement and empowerment that they have provided for everybody, including myself, to hear you uh, talk about your cases and 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 be the way you are. So that's uh, uh, that's all we can ask for. Thank you all very much, and thanks to everyone everyone who's joining us. I will um, add the uh, uh, email again if people are interested in sharing their stories or their cases, or if you think we should address uh, certain cases out there, because we will always do due diligence before we make anything public uh, with the people that we uh, are uh, speaking with. So it's sc at palestineincontext.org. And you can also find this video and other videos at palestineincontext.org. Thanks again to all our um, co-sponsors and, and the organizer, the DC, Maryland, and Virginia faculty for academic freedom, who uh, led the charge for this event uh, and this series, as well the, as the co-sponsors, including the um, uh, Faculty for Justice in Palestine Network, the national uh, sort of network with more than 115, perhaps 120 uh, chapters uh, to the Gaza and Context Collaborative Teaching Project, as well as the MESA Task Force, uh, which has been Task Force on Civil and Human Rights, which has been instrumental for so many years. And uh, we thank them for supporting uh, this effort. Hope you all uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, stay safe. Salam.